And we are back with the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup presented by McDonald's of North Texas. But right now, we're chowing down. It is, we're actually cooling down because this is the Smoothie King Bowl break. We all got some nice, delicious Smoothie King bowls right here on the desk. I personally am enjoying the goji berry crunch right now. It's, uh, it's delicious. I was choked on it. Artie, <laughs> what are you eating? <laughs> I'm eating the exact same thing as you, but I'm not going to attempt on-desk ASMR and fail in a bowl that absolutely fabulous, but tragic fashion. We don't need anyone choking on desk, and if anyone is going to, it's probably going to be Los. Probably. Chicks up. <laughs> PB Swizzle Bowl. We, we got the, the peanut butter drizzle, which for me, I, I like it. I like peanut butter. It's great. Bananas, blueberries, granola. We, we got all the jazz. It's yummy, and I'm excited to chow down more instead of talk. It sounds very hearty. That sounds very good. But I have something a little more fruity. I've got the high five bowl. It's got banana. It got mango. Oh, it's so refreshing. And that's exactly what I need right here on this little smoothie break. <laughs> Certainly. All right, well, break time's done. Time to get back into the, into the action here. We have more Smash coming at you. Now that we have had the group decider in our previous matchup of Winthrop and Northwood University, we do have some updates in the bracket, and we are going to be heading into the round of eight. Coming up in just a few moments, I believe it's going to be UT Arlington versus Manchester, an exciting one. Round three of groups. So it is Manchester versus UT Arlington. It's time to decide who will actually make it into the next level of gameplay. Miles, you have some experience. You have the knowledge of these two teams. Could you kind of set the stage of what these two teams are bringing to the table? Let's start out for, with Manchester, who just won their last match against Sac State to even get here. They are known for their preparation. At the head of their team is Pars, one of the best coaches in Smash Brothers. And they are going to make sure that every single team in this group is fully accounted for. All the players are fully ready for them. UT Arling, on the other hand, they are one of the best teams in... I'll say it, they're the best Smash team in Texas, unless someone here wants to prove me otherwise. UT Arlington has demonstrated victories throughout many leagues, and they have come so close to beating a lot of these top echelon teams. This, on their home turf, is their opportunity to prove it right in their hometown. <laughs> I, was, I was enjoying this movie, King Well, I actually, I'm still breaking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Manchester, I mean, we have a, a big brain on Manchester, we have pars, but does that skill translate into the actual game, Artie? I mean, it can and it can't. If you do your research, you do your homework, you become as prepared as humanly possible. Um, the Batman, so to speak, in this instance, you can fight any bad guy so long as you have all the details necessary and can bring everything you need, then yes. But at the end of the day, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be a Herculean task. It's David versus Goliath. You know, everything's bigger in Texas, including the skill of their Smash players, because honestly, we have not only regional ranked players, but these ranked players are known nationally as being, well, people you never want to run into in Smash. Yeah, you'd love to like learn from them, but playing against them, you want to cry. With that being said, I have to give best of luck to Manchester, but UTA right now is just looking absolutely spicy. And I love spice. <laughs> That's why you, we often saw that in the, uh, the saucy predictions. But Chicksa, this has been said, or at least there have been whisperings, UT Arlington. Such an incredibly strong team. Do they have any weaknesses? You know, at the founder, at the captain of the ship is that Army Ali player, and he is the one that we look at that has no weakness. So if he's starting it off or either anchoring, I would be completely afraid of what he's going to put on. Since even Miles said he has no weaknesses or at least seemingly. And if Miles could break it down and say that somebody is potentially <laughs> unbreakable, like that, it, that to me is like, you know, holy grail, Miles, I, I take what he says pretty seriously. So I think if Manchester U and Pars in particular 
has prepared and has found some sort of break in the armor against Armiali, I'll, I'll be very impressed. I mean, that's what he's there to do. He's there to captain. He's there to coach. He's there to prep his team as much as possible. But um, I, don't, I don't know. If everyone's so ranked and so unbeatable, then uh, maybe it's just not possible. A daunting task, but Miles, looks like your face tells me you've got more to the story. This team is a very intricate puzzle box because, like you said, there's no clear weaknesses and also no clear strengths. And that's not because they're not good, but because everyone is so high, so around the same level that they all have different peaks in different areas. Phenom is flashy and unpredictable. Army Ali is stable and consistent. Curry is dynamic and, well... We'll turn the swing of a match in an instant. We saw Copel earlier, Curry in very much the same vein in that heavyweight category. So many different strengths on one roster. It falls to Manchester to be prepared because I think going in blind, Manchester, you might be right. It could possibly be impossible if they went in blind, but they're not going in blind. They are going in prepared. They are going in knowing that this is their last chance to make it into this bracket. This is the decider. So if Manchester is ever going to pull all that knowledge, have a strategy for every single scenario, this is that time. You know, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper on strategy in terms of that. So, Pars, one of the greatest coaches in Smash right now, but does that have the biggest impact? If you have the strategy, how well does it translate when you're going up against strong players with just great fundies? In theory, it works out great because everyone, even the highest level of players, have weaknesses, have habits that you can exploit. And if you choose the right time and place to exploit those habits, you can get massive rewards from it. However, as the saying goes, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And if you're too flustered, too disrupted to find the win condition, to find the way to implement this plan, then all the planning in the world is going to be for naught. Well, I feel that once I get punched in the face, I kind of just start flailing. We'll see if that's going to be the case for UT Arlington, if there is a, a major strike coming from Manchester. But I want to just get some predictions off the rip. Based on what you're saying, I, I'm a believer in uh, no think, just go. Uh, so based off of the strategies that may be employed by Manchester, I think when it comes to the end of the day, if it is regionally ranked players up on this roster, I got to go with my prediction on UT Arlington. I am also going to be siding with the side of UT Arlington on this one. Chiksa. Uh, I, I hate stacking with deaths, but I have to go with UT Arlington. They, they're they just scary. They're, Prove us wrong. They're no clear weakness, quote unquote. We said David v. Goliath at this point. Arlington's well, the clear who, pick. Well, I, I mean, David did win at the end of the day. But David did win. David did win. Miles. Yeah, sorry, Manchester. It's going to be UT Arlington. <laughs> um, there's... There is a scenario. There are scenarios in which Manchester wins this. There is never an unwinnable game. But this is going to be tough. This is going to be an uphill battle, especially just getting off another match because you still have the other team's patterns in your head. You still remember what you were doing to beat them. Completely different change of pace. Now, it is important to note, UTA is actually coming off of a loss. It is a seeded loss, but Fisher College East did take them down earlier in this bracket. UTA is not unbeatable, but it's pretty hard. <laughs> so I actually want to dig a little bit deeper in terms of consistency in competing. What is the effect going to be when you just came off of a loss and you're still competing pretty much all day? How will this affect our players going forward into this last chance to make it into the playoffs, Artie? Well, I mean, when it comes to competing in any tournament, in any day that you have back-to-back -back games, it's really important to maintain a positive mental attitude, leave it all on the, you know, virtual field, so to speak. And one of the biggest things also is it's not GG until you hit that final screen and you stand up and walk away from that desk. So you have to go as hard as you possibly can. Try to stay as positive as possible. This is the game instance where you don't have a teammate in your ear talking your ear off or, like, saying anything to you that could theoretically tilt you it's all really just you by yourself in your own head. It is up to you to be your own foundation and support. And we have Los over here who wants to just keep digging dip deeper until we hit bedrock. Well, you have to dig deep into your own self and make sure that you are able to keep your mentals calm and collected going through all this. And at the end of the day, you have to know you tried your best.
at the end of the day, I mean, that also may be a, a bit of a, a stronger tilting factor if there is no one to pass the blame onto, right? Chixa, in, in the 1v1s, how do you feel that will establish a, or demolish, mental for a player? Yeah, I, I think, again, it's having that advantage. If you are that anchor player or that person that people are relying on, you do need to dig deep and make sure you find the opportunity that you can to play your best. Just overall, keep yourself in check. You need to be reasonable with yourself. You need to have a short memory from game to game. This is the best of three at the end of the day. So even if you had a bad first round, then your team adjusts according to you. There's a lot of factors that I think in that scenario when you're sitting by yourself, you have to just keep on breathing, keep on playing, and you know do the best that you can. And finally, Miles, what do you think, end of the day, consistently competing, how do you think that's going to affect both UT Arlington and Manchester? Well, when you get put in these high pressure situations over and over again, you need to, you develop a kind of resistance to the roar of the crowd. We talked a little bit about the experience on UT Arlington. I mean, Armiali's been in this game for over a decade. And while I know a lot of people have been playing, been playing this game in a while, that's how long Armiali has been well-known, since he was pretty young, I think, like all the way back when Super Smash Bros. Brawl was a thing. Um, so he is not going to get flustered, even by this massive venue, the biggest stage. The, he has the experience to weather this out. And I'll be honest, I don't know how long Manchester has been going at this. I know they have preparation, but do they have the experience and strategy to put it into practice right here? You know, I'm just curious now, a little bit of a sidebar. Have you competed previously, Miles? I have. Um, I would not say I competed well, but I competed. <laughs> can, can we get some more information on that one? I want to hear about the, the Miles all right. competition series. All right, all right, you know what, I'll say it. I'll say it loud and proud. I am a two-tour and I know it. I go out to my local, I support my scene, and I get bodied, like, you know, two rounds into the bracket. I try my best, I really do. But at the end of the day, uh, Caster John, that's, that's all I got. Um. <laughs> just, a, just, a, just a caster, being an analyst doesn't help. Okay, so this is kind of our demolishing our argument for why PARS might uh, kind of swing this, but even knowing a lot about the game doesn't always mean you can put it into practice. But these players are not me. These players are not me. This is PARS instructing other players on how to be good. And PARS is also good. <laughs> how far does coaching go? I know that you have taken some you know, leadership roles in your own esports team back at Boise. Can you speak more to that? So... Um I, I did graduate from Boise. I'm still attending and getting another degree, but I coach at George Fox University for Overwatch. And what Miles said is kind of like the epitome of, A, do as I say, not as I do, because you're still going to make the mistakes you point out to your own players. And then additionally, it's the taking theory and putting it into practice is not as easy as any coach or any player that's trying to help out someone who's new to the game is going to make it ever seem like. Everyone has their own challenges to face. Some things come super duper easy to them and then other things just don't make any sense. And so you have to fight your own battles and learn how to overcome each challenge individually. Yes, there's a foundation and a bedrock that everyone has to start from and work their way up, but some are just really fast builders and get a hold of a game, whereas others, they really struggle. They're going to hit those, you know, they need to go get a diamond pickaxe, so to speak, because they don't have the right material currently to go where they need to go. And honestly, Miles, I commend you for being honest on desk about your experience as a player. And yes, while you can analyze the living daylights out of a game and be really good at like looking at strategy and telling people what is and is not the right thing to do, it does not always translate into in-game skill. But Coaches and analysts in general, when it comes to the team environment, it's not your job to be good at the game. It's your job to be the bedrock for someone else, to be their support, give them the materials that they need and build them up, not yourself. Now at the same time, how does it affect being a coach and trying to do that same thing while also being a player within that roster? It kind of beats on your own mental a little bit because you're a perfectionist. You are trying to, if you are in the roster itself, you need to fight the urge to understand that you are not always going to be the best at the game. 
and also at the same time trying to be that best player because it's like if I'm the coach, I therefore need to be perfect. I therefore need to be the one taking the most stocks in these situations. But at the end of the day, you're still human. You can't do that. You have to admit that at the end of the day, someone is going to best you in these situations. One of your players might best you. You might get 3-0'd and then your next player is gonna take six stocks. You do not know, there's too many variables and it ultimately comes down to your own mental ability to fight back those, you know, the intrusive thoughts that are telling you you're not good enough, you lost, you shouldn't be coaching, to tell yourself, no, I deserve to be here and so does that person who ended up 3-0'ing me and they just showed up a little bit more than I did today. I'm gonna go back, VOD review, figure out what I did wrong, and fix it. I, I was not prepared for that. I was not prepared for that answer, already. And you know what, it's time for me to come clean as well. I've gotten bodied at any local I've attended. It was just for fun. But I'm also throwing Polly Hype under the bus. And me and him competed at a Halo tournament. We got owed to uh, it. It was, it was a quick exit. A quick exit for that one. And I, I just feel like, through that speech, already. I need to uh, let the people know. Chixa, if, if you have any failures, you could go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, of course, in Rocket League, I, I've competed in the women's scene. Unfortunately, it's hard to compete and cast at the same time a lot, but I have competed whenever I'm not casting, and I competed earlier on. Uh, actually, my first time as captain, I, I won a season. So I'm pretty successful. I'm 1-0 I'm as being a okay. captain in Rocket League. But in the women's scene, my most recent tournament, uh, you know, we went two and three. We almost made it to the, to the group stages. So there, there's a certainly a lot of um, adjustments that you have to make in that, that captain role. You have to decide whether or not, at that point, I was building a roster, you know, trying people out. So I think PARS is going to do his best in the captain role to place people in the correct order and, and such like that on Manchester. That'll help them out in the long run. So I'm excited to see if they do kind of have that same counter pick that we saw in our, our first series of the day. If they can counter pick correctly, every player makes mistakes. No matter the level, the spectrum of play, everybody will make a mistake at the end of the day. So if you can utilize it and counterattack on those mistakes, then you just may have the advantage of David v. Goliath. Well, let's find out as we turn our eyes over toward the stage for the player walkout. And now, ladies and gentlemen, in Group C of competition for Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, please welcome the starting lineups. As the sixth seed, please welcome the University of Texas at Arlington. Army Ollie, Curry, Beastly, Davey. And their opponents, the 11th seed, Manchester University. Augment, Park, Fleetwood, Mitch. Now, welcome back to the stage to facilitate the pre-match showdown. Your host, Polly Hype. Woo! Learn to love it. All right. We are here for once again another amazing Super Smash Brothers Ultimate collegiate match. So please, team reps, head to the middle of the floor here. We have Manchester, of course. Come on over, UTA. Manchester versus UTA. UTA at the 6, Manchester at the 11. Please give us a little something going into this match. I'm excited to play. I just glad our team doesn't have hungry box DI like yours does. Woo! Woo, woo! Gotta love it. All right, UTA, last words over here to Manchester. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to play. We played earlier. Uh, Y'all play a lot of cool, fun characters. It's gonna be a cool set. You guys are so polite. All right, well, we're getting ready for some more Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup Super Smash Brothers action. Casters, over to you. All right, everybody, and welcome back to CECC May Madness, presented by McDonald's North Texas. I am Cy, of course, being joined by the lovely, the irreplaceable, the flawless Dara. 
How are you feeling right now getting into our second set? Uh, I'm feeling pretty excited. I'm excited to be able to cast a little bit of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. But I have two things I want to talk about. I think that was an incredible call out to say that, hey, you got a Hungry Box DI. And the other school's just like, hey, man, you know, we got some cool fun. <laughs> you know, I hope to get like a cool fun match. My heart broke a little tiny bit, but such is the nature of competition. So I do have a little something that I wanted to say, something a little uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, UT Arlington, fantastic school, fantastic team. They got a player they have a little bit of history with. Army Ollie, CEO 21. I got whopped. I yeah. got, I got, I got <laughs> schooled. I got, I, I, I was going into that matchup. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm excited for pools. I'm excited to compete today. Man, Army Ollie is good. Uh, annoyingly so. I, I think <laughs> that's going to be a really, really difficult opponent. Th that is, like, in my mind, like, one of the shining stars of UT Ollie LinkedIn. I remember that match, and I remember my desperation as I was getting hit by all sorts of Pikmin, all sorts mm. of all of my stuff, that I'm mm. like, wow, i got to remember that matchup. That does not matter. That's not the players that we have sitting down in front of us. Everybody, I am excited to bring to you UT Ollie LinkedIn versus Manchester. It's going to be a fantastic set. Yeah, I'm looking at the Manchester roster, and it looks like a lot of FGC characters. I see uh, they have Pars running Kazuya. They have Augment running Terry. Right now we got Tamaki up there with the Ken and Fleetwood yep. No Mac is going to be running Steve. <laughs> so all FGC characters and Steve. So that is that is really really tough. Meanwhile, on the UTA Arlington team, they've got a lot of their character pool. We've got Fox and Cinderwar, Inkling, of course, Army Ollie, the Pokemon trainer. Uh, or Ar Army Ali the Olimar and a couple Pokemon trainers. Oh, yeah. Don't you love seeing a top player and then you just, like, start trauma dumping about how much they've hurt you? Yeah. Feels bad. <laughs> Sometimes Feels you bad. just, like, you remember all of the pain that which you've once felt. But now we're going to be jumping into the match, though. So I do believe the Ken is going to be Tamaki. Uh, as for the Aegis, we're going to get some info on that ASAP. Ooh. But already the <laughs> spike coming out there, catching the upbeat back onto the stage successfully. And that's already one stock gone, 24 seconds into the match. Now, if this stays consistent, this could be really huge for UT Arlington because, like, I, I thought I thought she might die. So obviously that was a really early stock to take. Aegis is an incredible character. If Aegis is specifically good against the Shotos, like we're seeing, yep. um, this could be a huge problem for them because their roster is almost one character archetype entirely. But right now, uh, okay, it is Army Ali coming in. Yeah, Army Ali's Aegis, not Olimar, mm. is uh, crazy to see because that was such a fast stock. I think that was not even 30 seconds off the clock. So taking a stock that quickly is so detrimental. We're starting to see Mitch fight back. We're seeing these shore use. None of them are actually connecting and getting the early kill that we need. So uh, going to have to be really careful about this. But yeah, as long as Army Ali just continues spacing carefully, as they get back here to the face, I will end that sentence right there because uh, Mitch is here to play too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was just, like, a really good call-out. Right? That's, like, one of the only ways that Pilot can, like, consistently get back on, just by popping out that side view to give yourself a little bit of coverage. But if you're able to slip in there, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm speechless. I can't believe that Hadouken was able to stop that charged Pyro Neutral B. An incredible moment of clanking, because a lot of characters died in that exact yeah. position. Okay, so it is going to be Davey. It's not going to be Ollie. Oh, okay. This is Davey, Davey coming in with the Aegis here. And I got to say, Davey is Ooh. putting on a fantastic performance. That was such a good bait. Dash in, dash out to bait the ledge goal. Then you're able to get that up smash, and then a beautiful whiff punish from Davey. This Aegis is looking clean, solid, and just really fun dice heavy. Yeah, speaking of dash out, dash in, that's exactly what took that second stock right there. Like that <laughs> fake out, Mitch was fully committed to the focus attack, and honestly, you kind of got to keep charging it to see what happens, see if they interact with it incorrectly. But unfortunately for them, Mithra and Pyra both have a lot of multi hits, so they're able to like break through that armor, and that's not the get out of jail free card it normally is in a lot of matchups. This is looking really good for Davey. Huge combos coming from Mitch, not able to confirm into the Shore you just yet, but even at these tender, only 80%, being near these platforms is really, really scary. So David is going to have to be very careful when it comes to stage positioning against a character like him. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, oh was going for the hard punish. But the unless SDI? the SDI, absolutely, out of the upbeat, able to get out of there, looking for something funny. Davey just wants to get rid of the stock expeditiously. Wow, this is not normally a thing I see being, like, accented on a crew battle, like, DI, but, like, UT Arlington not only made fun of their DI, they're SDI oh, yeah. out of kin kills, and that is, that takes a lot. Now, they don't have a jump, so I think this is going to be their stock regardless. Got tapped out of the jump and sent horizontal, and that is just a death sentence at nearly any percentage uh, for a character like Aegis. So we have one stock each of 
incredible spot dodge, making sure that that focus attack does not connect. Uh, Mitch is going to have to dig really, really deep to be able to bring this back. But if there's anybody mm. that can do it, it's actually going to be Aegis. Uh, that's <laughs> definitely what I was going to say. Uh, that was my exact thought process. Thank you so much, Aegis, for cleaning up that stock with another up tilt. What I was going to say, classic stuff that we've always been talking about since Smash 4. Ken and Ryu, a little bit of rage, all of a sudden they're taking stocks off mm -hmm, of up tilts mm -hmm. at 60%. But in this case, that's not going to happen. Davey able to clutch that one out. Uh, ooh, not clutch that one out. That was like a confident like stock lead win. Uh, they're going to be going into this next match with just one stock to their name. But what we saw like thus far, we just saw like good spacing. We saw good ledge trapping. Just overall, a really solid Aegis play. Yeah, and honestly, I think that both players played really well. Davey got that surprise stock right off the top of the match under Surprised like 20 me. seconds. Surprised all of us. Yeah. And as we keep saying, if you can find those, you know, those weird setups that don't work more than once, but they will work once, fantastic to pull it out in a crew battle. But Mitch really clawed his way back, really did a really good job of taking the momentum back to their side and made it pretty close, pretty competitive. But that oh, up yeah. to it out of shield. Pyra's up, I love that we have the kill screen on that. Pyra's up tilt is enormous and people never talk huge. about it. It's huge. I mean, I just feel like there's so many other things going on with Aegis that you're like, wow, all of these options are, to put it lightly, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, that you just sometimes forget about the things like up tilt and F tilt. And you're like, wow, these are huge safe buttons that cover from behind all the way to in front. She can be back like a mile away and still be able to connect some of those. So Davey just really exploiting the most out of those options, just able to play back space well. Uh, just going to be waiting to see what the next opponent has in store. I do believe that this is going to be Pars, the Kazuya that we've all spoken about. Yes, Pars, uh, one of the top coaches on Metify, somewhere like the top three, as far as like consistently being able to get sessions, playing Kazuya, one of the scariest characters in the game. Remember we were talking earlier, we saw like Lucina and Roy, we're like, okay, it's kind of honest. And this is what I meant by comparison, because Kazuya and Aegis are both incredible characters. Yep, that's a, that's a very light way to put it. We mm -hmm. cannot actually overstate what is happening. Fellas, it is time for the battle of the DLC. Already a trip into the side B. Oh my god, <laughs> this is a lab monster. Pose was waiting his whole life to be able to press buttons like this today. My god, I literally was just like, is this the stop? Like, Kazuya <laughs> leaves so little room for air when he actually does get going. But incredible ledge trapping coming out from Davies uh, Aegis right there. That's looking really good. In the scene, we call that the American air dodge. Mm. The big old directional air dodge right back on to the stage and Davey took some advantage of that, was able to get a couple of hits out of it, but there was just so much pressure that Kazuya always exudes. You have to Ooh. keep up the juggle, you have to keep up the disadvantage, and Davey able to now really get just perfect returns, cleaning up that stock with an up smash. What I love, Davey has been hit a single, oh, well, oh. okay. Davey got hit by a single mistake, took 44%, it was like, you will never touch me again. Oh and yeah. <laughs> Mithra is such a good character. Honestly, both of them are a pretty good character for like keeping Kazuya at bay, crazy option. I cannot believe that beat that laser. Uh, but such a good character, keeping oh Kazuya at bay. God. And rarely edgeguarding Kazuya. We don't see a lot of that. But uh, I would describe Pyra's down air as the size of, let's say, a 1993 Toyota Camry. And unfortunately, <laughs> clunky. maybe even a little bigger than that. And Kazuya was not able to avoid it. Davey playing amazing. Is Davey going to three stock pars? Pyrus is just not able to land right now, just taking so much damage, waiting a little bit, delaying, making sure that, hey, you know what, you can spike me once like that, not going to get spiked the same way twice. Patrolling the ground a little bit, going to be looking for that electric, which can't combo into an up B, but just looks for the Philips tech on the platform, but doesn't actually set up the tech chase. Davey was a little bit too far to the left and did not land on the plat. This means so much for Manchester, because they lose the stock right now. They're going in with a huge deficit. Aegis is a character that takes stocks very quickly. Oh, yeah. Is that a little up throw? Oh, no my God. No way. Dave. And there it is. Davey getting the three stock, which is not only difficult in itself, but landing that against Kazuya is very hard. That means you made no mistakes because it only takes one, two mishaps at most for Kazuya to just obliterate a stock from you. Yeah. Uh, I really just want to, like, boil down to a lot of this play was, hey, Davey's advantage was super solid. The juggling was really solid. Kazuya cannot combo you. Kazuya cannot do Kazuya things if his feet are not on the ground. Mm -hmm. Very simply put, if he is on the ground, whoa, buddy, you're going to be looking out for an electric. You're looking out for all of these funny little Kazuya things. But Davey just, you know, that was not an option for a good chunk of that game. Now, the times that Pars was on the ground, feet planted, we saw something in the beginning that could have been something huge. But alas, 
Glass not getting the full combo out of it, there was a second misplay. And that was going to be the electric uh, that was on the platform. Mm -hmm. Well, rather, that sent towards the platform. And Pyre's decided to go for the flip stack. The double jump cancel, auto cancel, neutral, right? Landed, but alas, uh, Davey was all the way behind him. Didn't actually set up the tech chase as intended. Did not result in the kill. So there was a couple of moments where that could have gone super differently in favor of Pyre's. But you clean up a couple of those stocks with those spikes like that. Davey just keeping themselves just alive and getting so many stocks for their trouble. Yeah, and honestly, I think that moment was such a key deciding moment in that set because even if it may not have killed, honestly, all that rage on Kazuya, if Pars just pulled the trigger and just gone for an uppy instead just to see if it would kill, things could have been different. At least you could set up a juggle. At right, the very least, right. you might be able to catch a landing, but that's just like one little tiny misplay happens to the besties of us. Yeah, but you're, you're completely right. Davey's entire game plan was hanging out on the left and right platforms and just waiting for Pars to just make a mistake. Because you saw Pars at center stage, feet planted, being Kazuya, being scary. Yep. So you're not interacting with that zone, and Davey's like, I'll never be down there. I'm never going to be where you want me to be. And honestly, it's eventually Pars got a little impatient, would try to like chase Davey down, and trying to chase Mithra with her speed and her frame data, not the best option for most characters. Today is a good day for DLC. Yes, it is. <laughs> man, yes, oh, man, is. we are getting a whole lot of it. And, uh, 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 Gross. Gross. That even looked a little bit too far back for the min min dash yes. grab. I was like, whoa, that's a that's a little bit much. All right. And we see a political statement in Save Steve, and I have to staunchly disagree. But uh, min min coming through 103 to only 23%, playing fantastic, really taking a lot of stage control away from Davey quickly. Oh, yeah. Landing against Pyro on PS2 was pretty tough. Finds, Fleetwood finds their way down, though, but they have to take the stock and they have to retain this because it is but currently 10 to 6. But patient Fleetwood is, right? Not landing immediately with a button, just waiting, not even fast falling immediately either. Looking to get this jump call out with the new trailer. doesn't actually find it. Davey mm -hmm. slowing down the pace of the game just a little tiny bit. We're seeing a good chunk of empty movement from the both of these. Against Min Min, a lot of your gameplay, uh, a lot of your game plan, excuse me, is just waiting until both of her arms are out. Then she can't punch anymore. Mm -hmm. That's when you go in. Ooh, Ooh, nice spot dodge in the down smash. Davey was correct on getting the roll read. Just misspaced it a little bit. Just needed to back up one or two steps more. Or maybe go for an up smash instead. But that was crucial for Min Min to take that game. Because 10 stocks to 6, is it's quite the deficit already. But now we're going in 9-6. Yeah. Min Min, I think, is a very good character overall. Great cruise Fantastic. character. A great A, matchup check. B, great at keeping you out and preserving those stocks. Min Min's recovery is a little bit lackluster, but once Min Min is in center stage, you are playing a really tough mini game. It does not matter who's on the character select screen. Matchup check, and most importantly of all, if you're anything like me, that is a huge psychology check. Oh, you yeah. have to be like mentally stable to fight Min Min well, right? Because that is somebody that deals active psychic damage over the course <laughs> of a match. You get hit with a couple of arms, and then you're getting edge guard, and you're like, wow, I have no double jump off stage. Am I just gone? And the answer is yes. So you have to be okay with accepting life and all of its brutal circumstances that it throws at you. Fighting Min Min is difficult for just about anybody. Yeah, it's very tough. It's almost an ADHD check, too. I get a little <laughs> impatient, and honestly, something like that, I'm like, stop hitting me with your arms. Like, I get, I get impatient. Yeah. I run in. I try to, like, force stuff, take more damage. Fighting Zodos for us is hard. It's, it's hard. really difficult, it's hard. okay? We have a medical diagnosis proving it, damn it. I suit, I, I, as soon as I got my ADHD mess, I started performing better in tournament. I'm like, wow, look at that. Anyway. Anyways. <laughs> um, so we got Diddy versus Min Min. This oh, yeah. is an interesting one. So Diddy, if he can stay up close, has great frame data, can really pressure you, can do a lot of ledge pressure, and her recovery is very bad in this matchup. And so far, uh, it looks like we're seeing some really good play here. Not really getting zoned out too far, but I do see that kind of coming up. Really. And so I, I think something that is so important in this matchup, we have to talk about Banana. Banana is not a regular projectile for all of those that are uninitiated, it is a transcendent one. What does that mean? That means you cannot hit it. You can catch it, you can reflect it, but you cannot hit it away. Min Min does an excellent job with dealing with projectiles when she can hit them, but, but Banana, you know, for the sake of a bad pun, is able to really slip in there and actually <laughs> interrupt Min Min for whatever she's doing. Yeah, Min Min can't really ever rest comfortably. Even if Diddy gets a little bit further past mid-range, Monkey Flip Kick is an incredibly good tool. Yes. Uh, obviously, it is either a command grab or an attack, and it is up to the Diddy Kong to decide which one he's going to do. And typically, I'm a Diddy main right now, and I just wait for the opponent to choose either shield or attack and just choose the opposite option. It's an incredibly good move. I like earlier that we saw some solid edge guard attempts. We saw an attempt at a Let's Trump back air from Beastly. And oh, the forward tilt, tilt, great range, disjointed, very safe. 
excellent for killing. It's Great. a really good button. It's a very good button. It's very nice soft. and safe, and you look at this patience with Beastly as well, mixing up some of these timings. Hey, 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 hey be careful. In. Okay, you know, Beastly just going to be cutting the losses at that point in time. Now Fleetwood just going to be backing off a little bit. But look at that boost range from Diddy Kong. He is jumping in. He is side being in. Up to go. Not going to be able to do it, but maybe Fleetwood can't actually catch that landing. Oh, this is a beautiful play. And Beastly was doing something very subtle and sneaky there. If you see Diddy Kong going for those, if you see Diddy Kong going for those neutral airs at the corner, yes. they are trying to find it down there. They're trying to take a, a stock under 50%. And that is exactly what Manchester needs right now. Absolutely. You just have to set up an edge guard against Diddy Kong. That is one of the best ways that Min Min can cheese Diddy Kong. You knock him out of those barrels with eat any one of your buttons, honestly. Ooh. And that's going to be Ooh. a dead Diddy Kong. Ooh, down throw into side B. I love it. That's that's a little bit of the advanced Diddy sauce Ooh. right there. Oh, that was a forward smash. Miss input from Beastly. But there we go. Going into the down air. I don't want to be biased. I just love watching good Diddy Kong play. But he uh, Beastly is running all over Fleetwood at this point. Yeah, Beastly just nice. so much pressure, so much confidence, so much maneuverability around the stage. Fleetwood just wants to back up, wants to be able to get some space. Nice. But look at that banana coming on in there. Beastly going through those high tech, high execution combos. Not actually fully able to get it, but still able to cut through losses and get a good amount of damage. I can tell you, I actually was labbing that specific combo out. If you do it right, it can lead up to like 70%, but it's actually very frame tight. It takes a very specific uh, window for that down there to give you enough hit stun to get that combo. So it's tough. It's like a one or two frame link, honestly, to get it. Yeah, that shield pressure can be sleep. Super tight. Hit shield, back off a little bit. Oh, you pressed up smash out of shield. Fantastic. I'm going to be able to get a nice, delicious little punish. Fleetwood, again, always a little bit too late on catching Beastly coming back down. Beastly has been escaping this advantage against Ooh. Fleetwood, able to slip in the, between both the hits. And finally, nice, Megawatt nice. is going to be able to do it. But 95%, you're down a little bit deep. Can Fleetwood pull this one under? Yeah, this is looking pretty good. Monkey Flip Kick is doing exactly what you said earlier. As soon as Min, Min doesn't have arms, Monkey Flip, doesn't matter if it's going to be the command grab or the kick is just going yep. to shut Min Min down consistently. She's never able to play her game. And now, dancing for her life at the ledge, Z Drop Banana, not going to do it just yet, but very uncomfortable situation for Min Min to be in. That's that a should huge do it. risk that Beast no. took, but no, Min Min actually going to be a little bit too heavy for that. Now just going to be looking for another way to get back down. Excellent get up attack to be able to interrupt that F tilt. Not going to be able to get oh, it again. This is, big. this is big. This is huge, but goes through the high recovery, making sure that they mm. can't get stuffed out. I can't believe that forwarder didn't kill either. If he went for the raw back here, I think that would have done it. <gasps> Great coverage. Great patience from Fleetwood, though. Fleetwood, Fleetwood has been in ledge trap hell. Back oh, and the back throw of all things is what does it. That's crazy. If you died to Diddy Kong back throw, you have been alive for too long. Mm -hmm. That should not be happening. You're like, okay, you're 170, 180. Okay, it's time for you to go. Pack it up. Right. <laughs> My goodness. Now, if you don't know about Min Min, when she gets a throw, it powers up the Dragon Arm. And those uh, Dragon Arm smash attacks are incredibly strong. We've seen a lot of really early stocks just oh, yeah. from like, uh, back throw to back air, and as soon as it's I saw that one. happen, it's the day it's one, the day one, one check. Yep. And crew battles are where you pull this stuff out. So with all that rage and s having Diddy be off the stage, even at like 40%, both of us, we're like, oh, we've seen this movie before. Diddy could die right now. But Beastly held strong. I, I loved Beastly's game plan. I loved how efficient the ledge trapping was, especially considering how kind of awkward Min Min is at getting off the ledge. Yeah. And that's when she definitely struggles, right? She yeah, loves having yeah. stage control. She loves having space. She loves being able to edge guard. She is so comfortable in so many places besides getting off the ledge. She has one of the most exploitable jumps from the ledge in the entire game. Mm -hmm. She has a fairly exploitable ledge hang. Her recovery isn't all the best. And let me tell you, Diddy Kong, he tosses out a peanut. He tosses out a banana as well. He just is able to apply so much pressure and aha. You thought that you could wait? You thought that you could be patient? Alas, I have an F tilt with your name on it. So this is going to be, I believe, Manchester's last play. Mm -hmm, um, that mm -hmm. is going to be Augment, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. A lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. Now, Terry, a very good character. He does have all three socks, so of course he's going to get access to Go, and uh, um, that's really powerful. Seven socks with the Shoto is tough. Because somewhere in there, there's going to be a counter pick, even if you make it out of this. And Beastly is playing amazing. 49% right off rip. We're going to see some big punishes here. Uh, one of the big things that Terry gets is uh, jab is really important to him. He gets a whole lot of like damage out of it. But Beastly has yet to even be touched. 108% uncontested. This is looking fantastic for the UT Arlington team. Oh, absolutely. Go is already on deck. Ooh. Tries to go for Ooh. a little something. Not going to be able to find it quite yet. Backing off a little That's bit at nice. the ledge. That F tilt is putting in work. No double jump off stage. This should for all intents and purposes be a dead Terry. That's it. That should be it. That's it. Yep, back here Damn. just in case. 
perfect play from Beasley. Got hit by a single move, spelling even more disaster for the Manchester team. They really needed a huge comeback, and Beasley is not giving an inch. A Beasley character. is enforcing his own game plan. He knows his own win condition at this mm -hmm. point and just going all the way with it. Augment is just struggling to find a single, clean, consistent opening. When Teddy does so, I mean, that damage output is egregious, Damn. but when you're not letting him in, man, it's tough. I am literally just like watching the strings of how this would be dangerous just because I'm playing so much Diddy. And honestly, that situation with that uh, down tilt to Dare, I thought that was going to do it. That was supposed to be it, right? That was supposed to be the jump call out. But alas, again, Ooh. now has to use up the double jump yet again, using the power wave to stall. But just the last hitbox of that foil is going to be connecting. Man, this is, this is brutal. Yeah, and that's one of the things. I remember watching Tweak versus Riddles. One of the main places that Tweak was able to find socks, you can rinse and repeat. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Uh, let me finish that thought, but that was crazy. That was hype. Manchester needed that. But you can rinse and repeat your edge guard against the Shotos because all three of them have to do like a side B yep. to get back to the stage, and there's so much lag between that. Diddy can just send you back out with forward air. He can send you back out with back air. Uh, and honestly, once you do get close to the ledge, that two frame from the F tilt is incredibly tough to deal with. Mm -hmm. So you saw um, Augment was really just in that rinse and repeat cycle for a long time, but coming back with the spot dodge cancel into the power gazer was very smart. Absolutely. Um, something I also do want to bring up, in the context of a greater crew battle format, Terry is actually a fantastic pick. Why? Well, first of all, I would like to say that he has a lot of survivability. Compared to a lot of similar characters in his archetype, he has a lot of recovery mix-ups. Every single one of his specials do something for him, and he has a surprising amount of horizontal distance, and a ridiculous amount of hitboxes all around him. So he is able to survive, thanks to that also being a super heavy, or heavyweight rather, um, you know, 132% in a crew battle means you're still going in with two stocks exactly. instead of one. Exactly. It can make all the difference. But now you're going up in, against Incinerary, somebody, a character that's been putting on so much work recently, thanks to the likes of Sky J. Woo! Big, big Sky J fan big over here. Big Sky J fan. If you're not, then come on, what are you doing? Oh, exactly. How, so how could you not be? He's one of the most dudes rock dad energy players I've ever seen in my entire life. I promise. But yeah, so now we have heavy versus heavy. Incineroar can live a long time, but if Incineroar revenges anything from Terry, we can spell disaster for the Manchester team. Oh yeah, absolutely. But right now, we're trying to get that second up. Barely able to find mm. a couple of those. And oh, buddy, somebody almost air dodged right into the back hit of Incineroar's up smash. That thing, that is the golf swing that takes you all the way off the top. Jumping Tomahawk neutral B as well. Augment needs to adapt ASAP. Yes, and also, because the Incineroar kills so early, Go is almost less of a factor because it's very common to see a character like Terry die sub 100. Looks like he made it to the promised land. He's got 100, so he has options like Buster Wolf. He has Power Gazer, so Curry yeah. has to be extra, extra careful. Okay, a little bit of back throw. Going to be able to get some stage control. Nice. Tries to go for the Power Geyser, but alas, that's not going to be able to do it. It does not connect. You give up a lot of stage. A uh, mm. little spaghetti, a little tomato sauce. So, oh, mama mia, buddy. <laughs> a little bit there, yeah. We're seeing some big haymakers. Oh, I thought we were going to see the Power Gazer. He was trapped on the ledge. That could have been an easy stock for Augment. But unfortunately, Curry's going to survive that and come in. One stock remaining for the Manchester team. What can Augment do about this? I felt like that should have been the auto cancel down B, but oh my gosh, the oh. downer actually going to be tripping, such as ultimate and everything having a chance to trip, of course. Augment is just looking for a way to take the stock off, but Curry is not giving it up quite yet. See, even right there, like a key neutral tool in uh, Terry down tilt, getting revenge, and now Augment <laughs> honestly might die right here. Oh no, that's it. That was oh. the most masculine exchange of all time. <laughs> that just two dudes swinging at once. That's all that was happening. They were swinging and whiffing, swinging and whiffing. Curry able to get stage control, able to get that edge guard with the neutral B. Uh, my goodness, that's going to be set one going to their school, or game one, excuse me. Um, they were looking super good. Yeah, UTA looking fantastic. I don't know if it's the power up. I don't know if it's the McDonald's jersey. Shout out to you all, McDonald's North Texas, of course. But they played amazing. Speaking of masculine kills, running off for a suicide lariat kill just to finish yep. off the first set or first game. Dang it, now I did it. Just to finish off the first game was fantastic. It was cute. It was a cute way it's to finish cute. off that game. Absolutely. I like it. Mm -hmm. now, Press the slay button. I'm here for it. I, I, I would like some clarification. Which school was it in the beginning that talked all that smack? I think that might have been Manchester. That might have been Manchester. If I were them, hey guys, listen, no shade. I'd feel a little silly for that. I'd feel a little silly talking a little bit of smack and then getting, you know, losing getting the game little, like that. That was the six stock dub. That was, uh, that was pretty tough. That was... Wouldn't let that happen to me. Also, uh, really funny to call out Hungrybox DI when he's currently restreaming it. Hello, Hungrybox. Hope you're having a lovely time. Oh, hey. As well as all of his chatters. 
I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the show thus far. Uh, this is, of course, the best of food crew battle, so we're mm -hmm. going to be getting one or two more potential matches, but Manchester has quite a few adaptations to make. Yeah, they've got some big changes. So as I said earlier, because so much of their roster is based on like Shotos or FGC characters, it's going to be really tough because if the other team obviously seems like they have deep pockets, if they can beat that archetype, your entire crew is in danger. And we saw it start off really mm -hmm. tough. Davey came in Davey with the Aegis so and just was cleaning up, taking really early stocks, uh, outmaneuvering everybody, had great stage control. That looked really hard. And honestly, even Curry's Incineroar, Shotos are great. Incineroar, I think, is great against the Shotos because like, they need to run in and they need to press buttons. They need to get those jabs, those down tilts to get combo started. But if Incineroar has options like Lariat, it's very yeah. hard to get that going. Revenge makes it really tough, and they have so much like damage and knockback on their moves. When he's getting those revenges, it's even scarier to run into him face to face. Yeah, Davey was just such a strong opening for them. Davey just got so, so, so much work in. Um, so that's definitely, you, you have to keep that in mind. You have to figure out who do we go in uh, against who to be able to like counter that threat. And then you have all of those other players to worry about. I gotta say, UT Arlington is looking like a beast of a team. And that wasn't even their entire roster. They weren't knocked down to the last player. Everybody that we saw, Davey, Beastly, and Curry, they all just looked really solid thus far. Yeah, speaking of beast of a team, as a Diddy main, Beastly, when he watches back, I am taking notes. Beastly was playing amazing. Yep. Extremely optimal Diddy Kong combos, extremely good stage positioning, tons of crazy ledge traps. This is really tough. Like Manchester, I think their best option might be to start mid-men just because like that could potentially stop the bleeding if they start with yep. Aegis again. But other than that, if they get counterpicked by Davey right off rip, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I also have a thought about Beastly specifically as well. Right? I love the fact that not only did Beastly like go through like a lot of those optimal routes, but oftentimes did drop them, but then still went through the next level of coverage instead of being like, oh wait, I just dropped my zero to ninety super technical combo. I guess it's over. You can win this interaction. No, 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 no. <laughs> Beastly still dashed back. Beastly still went through like another grab to pick things up. Beastly still kept covering options, mm -hmm. uh, and that like oppressive amount of option coverage. I mean, it, it, it felt suffocating to watch. Probably equally so if not more so, to fight against. It is. So I was explaining this a little bit to a homie a couple weeks ago. So you have your characters like, say, Kazuya, where like, you get hit and you're like, okay, it's going to be a death sentence. Diddy Kong does not technically do that, but what he does is he gets a ton of resets, and the scariest thing you can do against a Diddy Kong is panic. Because yep. the Diddy always knows when the combo is dropping, you don't. So if they stop the combo early and you burn that air dodge, here's another 40%. And it just it spirals so quickly if you don't know how to get, a dis get out of disadvantage against you them. You think I'm studying my disadvantage options? You think I'm thinking about situations? Buddy, I'm mashing. I am playing Ness. <laughs> I will mash out of it. And you know what? If I connect the neutral layer, uh, sure, I want that interaction, I Girl, guess. Girl, one of these neutral layers is going to do it. I'm going to just keep doing it. One of them. <laughs> one, of them one of them will eventually work out. But yeah, absolutely. Like uh, There's like so much like depth of knowledge in Smash of just like understanding, you know, not only like basic like fundamentals, but then also specifics of matchups and understanding situations. Mm -hmm. Your opponent being a main and, and you know proficient in that character is probably going to know more about those situations mm -hmm. than you find yourself in. There's 80 some odd matchups to think about in this game. They know their advantage, which isn't necessarily always character specific. Yes, and that's one tough thing about this. If you're on the outside looking in at Smash, not only is there an overwhelming amount of characters, Every character has something that you have to be very afraid of. Yeah. Not like, okay, this person has a good F-tilt. No, everyone's got something insane. Yeah. And in this case, going up against Ali Ali, against going, uh, excuse me, going up against Olimar, you're looking at up smash, up smash. Is that early starter? Mm -hmm. And you already see somebody's looking for it, somebody's fishing for it, and the question is, will he connect it? I think this is a really potentially good matchup to start with. Not only can Olimar put damage out really Ooh. quickly, even just with that one white Pikmin, stocks are already even. Olimar is really small. He has Whistle to get out of combos. It can be really, really tough for Ken to get those big strings that the Shoto character is so known for. In the meantime, he's doing really well. Uh, but one thing that's going to be scary for this too, uh, Olimar's grab specifically is probably really good against the Shotos. They're always kind of approaching like the same kind of angle, oh, yeah. and there's so much room for that grab to connect before you actually get to Olimar. It could be really disastrous if Mitch isn't careful. For sure. Now still able to come back onto the stage. Mitch is just Ooh. definitely holding the gun at this point, but Ali Ali is the one that is kind of controlling the pace. Red consistently knocking Mitch off stage, consistently controlling center stage. Nice. But that's almost the up into the short lead. But alas, that down be that whistle that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Olimar just able to use that as a means of getting back down to the stage, but the uh, yellow Pikmin not going to be able to do it. Oh my god, what is happening? What is happening? I don't know how he got out of that situation uh. there, but uh, Army Ali so far taking a lot of control, looking for the two-frame on the down air, been a lot of attempts, hasn't found it just yet, but Mitch does have to continue to be careful. <gasps> nice Beautiful. chase down. Great yeah. play for Mitch. 
And that dashing is so powerful as can because most people in that situation, they will almost always air dodge out, right? So it's a really good idea to dash in after that kind of an option. Comes back on with the side B. Army Ollie put themselves off stage, but alas, still able to get that stock off the top, keeping the stock count even. And when it comes to early percent damage, both of these characters are demons. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of demons, getting a jab lock, I love that. Throwing the Pikmin and trying to get a roll read. Army Ollie was definitely looking for the biggest reset they possibly could have gotten. But so far, not going to find it just yet. They do have two purple Pikmin, which is really, really good for them. But we've seen Mitch absolutely obliterating them. I saw one of the purple get kicked in the face by a full charge Ken down smash. Oh, yeah. They're never coming back. They are not seeing Pikmin 4. It's over. <laughs> yo, yo, Mitch just trying to get in there. Mitch just wants to get in there so badly. Mm -hmm. Looking for that falling forward. Looking for the up tilts. My goodness, that was almost a huge combo. But Army Ollie treating that disadvantage really well. Nice. But again, these Pikmin can actually be counterintuitive in a matchup like this because they can extend Ken's own hitboxes, right? Mm -hmm. Make some up tilts a little bit more active, ones that normally would not even be able to connect. One thing I think is really cool too, we saw earlier in no tag, like taking those gaps and trying to force your opponent to like burn a defensive option so you can keep getting those resets. Yep. Uh, Mitch has made that a tip because we see stuff like Ooh. Whistle uh, trying to like force Army to Ollie to panic, but they will not panic. Yo, that fade back with the focus, that was beautiful stuff, mm -hmm. right? Just like slowly mixing up the drift a little bit. Army Ollie wasn't able to get that first edge guard. That time around, it did come out though. Mitch did lose his second stock and now just looking through this next opening, looking for the landing aerial as Ken always does, but Army Ollie not having any of it. Now this is- <gasps> Oh, that's it. Oh, no jump. I was gonna say, Mitch is off to a really good start. Army Ollie, uh, you could consider them probably the biggest threat on that team, just statistically. I've just seen them do so well for so long. Yep. But uh, Army Ollie took that second stock really early. Ken dying at only 60. Just some great edge guarding coming out there, and that is going to put UTA in another big lead. Yeah, I mean, as a very like basic rule of you know all platform fighters, but then specifically when you think about like the shoulders in the context of this, you live and die by that double jump. Mm -hmm. As soon as you bring that thing off stage, does not matter what percent you are, this game will take your stock, right? And Army Ollie was able to exploit that. That is not something that goes both ways in this kind of a matchup. All of is up B. That thing has a lot of mileage on it. That thing has a lot of distance. And all of my, there is almost no position in the game where he's like, yeah, he's not going to make it back onto the stage oh, yeah. unless they just mess up the recovery. Like earlier, we were talking. We someone on Twitter, and if you're watching this, you did a very bad job. <laughs> made a recovery tier list, and I don't remember Olimar yeah. being that high on it. Olimar's recovery has insane range. There's tons of mix-ups with it, or whether oh, yeah. you are or aren't going to have Pikmin. There's different speeds. It's going to be depending on what he had when you sent him out. So it's very hard to predict it. And of course, his hurt box is really, really small. So and. I don't remember if anyone remembers the clip from Coinbox, shout out to y'all while you're watching, where I believe it was uh, Candle versus uh, Riddles, mm -hmm. and Candle went for a suicide up air under the stage while recovering. They would not have made it back, but Riddles wasn't expecting it, didn't get the stage check, and won the game. Olimar's recovery is very hard to predict. Doesn't yep. matter what level of play it's at, even there at the top level, it's tough to deal with. A lot of mix-ups, you can throw out the Pikmin to keep it nice and safe, but alas, we will now be seeing the return of Augment. So Augment, last time around, the biggest thing was what? It, like, not able to super, like, easily find a huge combo mm -hmm. opening. And then, whenever he really did get in there, uh, never, like, uh, really taking it too far. Oh. Immediate controller disconnect happens to the best of us. It Maybe happens. a little pro controller shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Listen, Army has to sacrifice a stock, so Augment decided to do it with the pause rule. Everything's the same. Totally makes sense. Oh, yeah. So, one stock gone, Army Ollie. Two stocks, two, three, still going to be on the first player here. The question is, Ooh. what is Augment capable of right now? Uh, capable of taking quite a bit of damage. Yeah, yellow up smash being one of the things to hit you at low percents is rough because Olimar gets so much damage off that situation. I see why they sent Augment in. In my head, I'm like, they're probably going to send Min-Min, and they sent Augment's Terry in. I'm like, I wonder why. But Terry does a very good job of controlling horizontal space, killing Pikmin, and stealing stocks because that... Uh, burn Knuckle off the side of the stage, killed at only 72. Massive play and 40% already right off the start from there. A saving grace of fighting Olimar is just mm. how light he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, you can if you could get him off the stage and into the blast zone ASAP, that's always a good sign. And now just looking for that air dodge reader, perhaps looking for the reader on that whistle, not able to actually punish it in time. Nice. Look at those landing mix-ups. That was so clean.
Yeah, Augment is really turning this up uh, this second game, playing fantastic oh, yeah. right now. We're seeing Burn Knuckle go through the Pikmin. We're seeing Power Wave be a problem. This looks really good. And, of course, Terry also has access to that disjointed uh, F-Tilt that's totally invincible. And now, go! <gasps> so, Army Ali has to be incredibly careful. Yeah, back to go for a bit of stage control yet again, being nice and patient, good covering low, and that hitbox is so, so, so generous, catching Army Ali's attempt to maybe get an edge guard. Nice! That up B is going to be able to take it off the top. Augment going to be keeping that stock count even. This is such a different game than last time around. Yes, this is so much better. And I almost wish I had a whiteboard to show you guys. So, as far as what stage control Augment had right there, if they stayed forward, uh, powered up Buster Wolf would have taken the stop. Mm -hmm. If they jumped and stayed back, Power Gazer had an option to connect. So what they tried to do was jump above, but Augment was crouching, still controlling those two positions, and got not just an upbeat punish, a fully charged rage upbeat punish. Yep. So honestly, Army Ali had almost nowhere good to go. I think the best case scenario would maybe be like run off stage and throw a Pikmin or something, but that specific position was so controlled. Um, and it looks mm -hmm. like Manchester's able to even things out and Augment is playing fantastic right option now. Option coverage, just quintessential classic option coverage and just thinking of like threat. When you have so many different options that you're actually worried about, you don't often get to actually see like Terry like up be out of shield specifically because of its lack of horizontal reach. Mm -hmm. But then if somebody's landing directly on top of you, forget that, you know, up be go spin. You go yeah. up. Yeah, up be go brr, brr. But, uh, I couldn't roll my R's right there, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> brr, brr. I don't know if I got it. Anyway, Beastly's coming in. We're going to have nine stocks to nine. We saw Beastly oh, yeah. go on a crazy run on that last one, playing phenomenal. Terry, of course, can get bullied by Diddy Kong. Uh, we saw Beastly do this really, really well earlier in the uh, previous time they played. Uh, let's see if Augment figures something out about this. Oh, such a good, that was like almost a mix-up, right? It's interesting to think about like jab three from Terry as a mix-up, but mm -hmm. the classic is jab, jab, power dunk, right? You saw Beastly actually, like actually end up dashing in, probably mashing SDI in, but good DI on the downer, right? Not holding out, not getting spiked to the blast zone. Augment took that damage, but hey, you're still alive, and that's what matters most. And once again, just like you said the previous time that we were watching Beastly play, if Beastly doesn't get the end of the combo that he wants, immediately goes back <gasps> to covering stage position. Oh, that banana almost tripped up Augment. Augment's still going to be stuck off stage, still going to be stuck in disadvantage. Beastly, nice. just so good at the ledge trap. Mm -hmm. Got to wait this out. Not going to be able to make it back. A very underrated move in Diddy Kong's kit, that forward tilt, it sends you at such a completely horizontal range. There are certain characters that just literally cannot recover. Oh, and yeah. it looks like uh, Terry, after a couple tries, might be on that list. And oh, important tech. Oh, for sure. Okay, looking for that option out of shield. Not actually going to be able to find it quite yet. Looking for those auto cancel, mash, spot dodge, power dunks. You know what that is? That is a vibe check. That is saying, hey, you want to hit me, don't you, buddy? You want to whip punish me? Psych, I have a spot dodge. Uh, Beastly was on the other side of the stage, though, so nothing happened. Right. And it doesn't come into play that often, but since Terry is the only person that has a spot dodge cancel, uh, he was in a really rough trap with that falling uh, banana and the landing up air. Like, there were so many options Beastly yeah. had, but being able to spot dodge cancel out totally took that off the table. So he stays alive, but ooh, here comes the edge guard. Okay, There's still makes portal. it back on, but I do believe that uh, Augment was able to get the double jump back because they did land atop the stage. Right? Yo! <laughs> but you know what? Incredible trade for Augment. Augment still has go active. Up throw into the up air. Not going to be able to do it quite yet, though. Mm -hmm. I think if he had done the reverse and done the other side of the hitbox, he might have had it. You can actually do a little bit of a 50-50 with that, depending on what side you're facing when you do that up air. So Augment was able to survive Ooh. it, but really kind of going through the blender right here. Taking a lot of damage at the beginning of this. Here we go. Even Yo, more. That, 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 that foot solo, is that a double jump? Does not matter. Into the Z drop banana. That is pressure, my friend. That was so much pressure that Beastly was exerting. Still able to cover uh, Augment's option with the jab there. Able to get a forwarder as well. Augment nice. just needs to land. Augment needs to get back onto the stage. Needs to find something. And there it is. A really rough trap. Uh, banana right at the ledge. You're not able to walk past it. And Monkey Flip Kick is going to punish you for shielding. And once again, rinse repeat on the edge guard. Tries everything he can think of. Now we see him going for like the power dunk. But all that Beastly has to do is wait just a little bit. Whichever option is chosen by Terry is punishable by forward air, back air, or even down air in the right position. Yep. Uh, and also that last situation was like a little bit unfortunate because that recovery might have been like a little bit of a hasty attempt. One of the things that Terry is not the best at is actually going to be snapping to the ledge, right? Yeah. You have to have very, very specific spacing on that up B to be able to sweet spot to it. That time around was not so lucky. Ended up going over the ledge. Ended up not touching the ground again. I know what that means. You don't get your double jump back, baby. So you're just a sitting duck uh, for an F tilt yeah. coming your way. There's so much time to punish that. And uh, Beastly took full advantage. So... 
that puts UTA at eight stocks to Manchester six. Still a really good battle. Still anybody's game in here. I don't want to count anybody out. I know that they still have that really strong mid-min player, but Beastly made pretty quick work of the mid-min. So we, I think we might be seeing Pars come in with the Kazuya. And honestly, Kazuya Diddy Kong seems explosive, but Kazuya Diddy Kong. I remember this matchup. I remember it specifically at Shine. Um, I remember this matchup. I remember Tweak was playing it, and it was Tweak circle camping uh, mm -hmm. for a very long extended period of time. I already forgot the name of the player who did play the Kazuya. Uh, forgive me. I will remember it at some point after and probably kick myself for it. But this is a matchup where Diddy Kong wants nothing to do with Kazuya. Yes. Not interacting. I'm running away, and I'm banana camping. You have to. So this is definitely just going to be a big test of Beastly's movement. Now, we saw earlier Pars was extremely comfortable holding down center stage and like waiting for options. And there it is, unfortunately, going for the monkey flip kick earlier. Gets the down throw. Doesn't get the full confirm to Beastly's sake because that easily could have been that first stock taken oh, yeah. immediately. Absolutely. And you see that like Beastly just trying to play back a little bit, play a little nice. bit more in the air. But now Pars able to get the flips tech, but alas, that banana pickup was not intentional. Yeah. He picked it up and kind of messed up his own flow a little bit. And okay, uh, mm. can you make this back? Rinse and repeat. There it is, fighting game characters. Diddy can just do this all day. Okay, able to go up and over Beastly. Beastly whiffing that back uncharacteristically, and uh, the dragon uppercut. Trying to call out that anti, trying to call out the aerial, didn't find it. Great play from Beastly, but now we do have a uh, rage drive on deck here. Beastly can't necessarily shield right now because even at just 58 percent, it could be a stock for Kazuya. Okay, really good patience. Pugs did not go for any preemptive air. I'll just right. Beastly wasn't able to find a back here as a result. Okay, is that going to nice. do it? Wow. Yep. Yeah. Diddy has a little bit of hoo-ha. You gotta, you gotta kind of finesse it a little bit, but it's still here. It's still here. Yeah, well, I feel like the biggest struggle right now. I'm like watching this, and like Pugs has just not found like that big opening yet. That like Kazi is like so infamous for, right? Mm -hmm. Beastly is like successfully zoning them out. All right, landing with the Nair. We haven't really seen any electrics coming out from no, Mars. No, not at all. And that's like the main tool that everyone is so afraid of from Kazi. There it is. Oh no, the buffer system oh, being a little timing. bit rough. Yeah, that might have just spelled disaster for uh, the Manchester team. Only dying at around 70%. That's huge for Arlington. Absolutely. Pugs right now just rolling back on. Okay, missing the tech nice. here. That's going to be a huge jab block oh! into the up B. Yes. Talk yes. To How do you feel about that? Again? The jab block into the down smash? Oh, I cannot wait. To I want to play right now so bad. I'm being so inspired by BC right now. This is just phenomenal play. Pars, how can you take this stock? Can you get back to the stage? Maybe the rage drive? I don't know. There it is, the rage drive, and that will definitely okay. do it at around 90%. So, does at least take that stock, but seven stocks to four, and you're already at 115. This is rough. Such Big opportunity. Such a good catch. That double jump forward it was huge. Pars, every dodge again. Uh, that was a little bit ugly. Pars now needs to find a way to be able to make it back on Beastly, doing the mm. same thing that they've always done. That transcendent banana, able to hit past the uppy. Okay, this could be huge. Tries to Phillips tech, but alas, the auto turnaround does not come in. The up smash does come out, though, and that's going to be yet another stock, yet another name that Beastly takes down. I think one thing I want to mention is that Pars definitely seem very committed to like trying to find big punishes from the Phillips tech, but none of them actually worked out. And once, okay, sure, second time, I don't know. But after you miss like the third or the fourth, it's just like, I know this is a strong option. This does cover a lot. But if it's not happening, maybe instead just, you know, slow it down, see how they react if you can't force the punish that you want, and then just go for optimal punishes based on if they roll or get up attack or yep. this, that, and the third. It, it happens to the best of us. You think that they're going to, you know, you're really thinking of like, hey, I want to cover this uh, position, and then you end up going the other direction, mm -hmm. and then you miss your tech chase. Right? It does indeed happen to the best of us. So that is going to be the end of pause. And now this is going to be the final teammate for Manchester. We're going to be seeing the return of, I believe, Fleetwood, right? Yes, Fleetwood was playing Min Min, Fleetwood, no Mac. But I don't know how they're going to handle this because Beastly still has two stocks, and Beastly was very dominant the previous time that they played. Yeah, this is tough. This is a tough one. That's, there's no better way to say it other than this is going to be tough. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, like we talked about it before, all of the different options that Diddy Kong has on Min, Min specifically to find like those kinds of openings. Uh, you're going to need to outplay a lot of your opponents really hard if you want really like hard. to stay in this. Really hard. Now, if he can find his way through this, and maybe we can see some early kills. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Ram Ram's uh, side side. Smash especially is very, very dangerous to deal mm -hmm. with Diddy Kong's recovery. I can see him getting gimped early, and, uh, you know, the Dragon's Breath could be a potential big threat, but Fleetwood has to make something incredible happen because not only do they still have to go through Beastly, there's still two other players 
looking at them on the other side of that. You got to just stay focused on the game at hand. You got to do whatever it takes to win with as many stocks as possible. One stock, I mean, this is definitely doable. You just got to space out past that banana, mm -hmm. right? Diddy Kong has so much boost range. Look at the distance that which he is able to combo from Beastly from the other side of the stage. Tossed out that banana. Look at his percent all the way up to 52. And Fleetwood needs to come back on. Oh, man, Beastly is playing oh so good. Oh, my God. These resets have just oh. been phenomenal. Covering every position, even preemptively having that banana up in the sky, reading that uh, Fleetwood wanted to go for that Min Min Dare to get back down. Oh my God. And banana to forward air. I always say this if you talk to me in person, criminally underrated option from Diddy Kong. It covers an incredible amount of space. When, no matter what air dodge or jump or resource you choose, Banana Florida actually just covers it. So if you're in that zone, it doesn't matter what character you are, you might be dead. Beautiful place for Beastly. Jesus. When I'm at 0%, yep. and my opponent is hanging on to the ledge, especially with a projectile, a universal rule is that they're up to no good. Mm -hmm. You're fighting Grob, and he's got Gyro in hand. You're fighting Pac-Man, and he's got the Galaxian. Mm -hmm. I promise you they have like a 0 to 80 combo. Yes, they're waiting for you to make that mistake. They're waiting for you to get greedy. And unfortunately, Fleetwood walked into the trap there. Beastly barely really taking too much damage in this set so far, only at 84%. And from a character like Mimi that puts out a lot of damage, that means there's only been a couple oh mistakes. God. That's a forward smash. Oh That's going to do it. God, if Diddy has been at the ledge, you have to respect it. It's literally the same danger as Diddy ledge trapping you when he's at the ledge. If he has that, he will take those stocks just like that. Everything that Beastly wants, he's getting. This is like Christmas. You're getting everything that you possibly want and more. Look at these extensions. Look at these combos. And Fleetwood finally able to land with the downing. But the question is, can you close this out with perhaps a little megawatt? Absolutely not. Such is the life of Diddy Kong side B. My God. God, that is an active hitbox. That was one of the scariest interactions I've ever seen because if a Monkey Flip Kid can beat that, that means that Min Min literally just has to like run back and respect it and cannot contest it at all. Yeah, that's like, you know, you're fighting a bowling ball and suddenly that is somebody that is capable of kicking past a bowling ball. Also, we saw Fleetwood go for the up throw instead of the back throw. I think back throw would have done it. Up throw still not going to do it. I think they... Should have back throw the first time, maybe up throw the second. Yep. Now up throw is a little stale. And Good Beastly patience. can easily take this final stock from Manchester. What do you do? You know what? Fleetwood's just trying to pull out all the stops here. Mixing up your timing like that, it is definitely helpful. You just need that one hit to have a chance here. But it's not looking so good for Manchester, I got to say. Yeah, this is rough. Oh, okay. Getting the back throw, not, or back air, not going to get the up air instead. Can. Fleetwood turn this around. We just need one up smash, one throw, one something. But this is the position where Diddy wins in. What I love about that, he threw the banana at the ledge, which meant that had Fleetwood been able to up B into the ledge in time, it would have been automatically two frame. And yep. because he waited, the sweet spot back air killed and said everything was covered. There's nothing Fleetwood could have done. That coverage was absolutely absurd. I love the fact that you point that out. You toss it to the side, and it's going to go down. You just got to angle it correctly, got to hit the right side of PS2. And that is an entire lane that is now blocked off. And you have all this traffic that's happening on the rest of it. And all you got to do is Diddy Kong. You got to position yourself. And hey, it's Min Min off stage. What kind of recovery mix ups does she have? Phenomenal question. Absolutely not. She yeah. can maybe stall with a double jump like everybody else at a cast can but the reality is she has no recovery options other than a swatting away an opponent maybe with her arms flailing as she's mm -hmm, making it back mm -hmm. onto the stage or b just up being as you would normally sometimes barely mixing up your positioning beastly took full advantage of min min's disadvantage this nasty place to be in great coverage great combo games super optimal punishes and a little bit flashy too beastly looking excellent, I gotta say. Yeah, just phenomenal play. I think the entire UTA roster is gonna go very far in this bracket. They played amazing. Beastly's a huge threat. Mm -hmm. Army Ollie's a huge threat. Uh, Davey's a huge threat. But right now, we're gonna cut to the stage. It looks like Pauly uh, wants to interview uh, one of the winners from the UTA team. Take it away. All right, I am here with Davey from UTA local team Arlington. That was an impressive win. Take the crowd here through the match. What were you were thinking and kind of the game plan going to that match? Um, I'm not going to lie. We're, we're not much of a game plan type of team. Okay. We kind of just threw people in. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So for all of you that don't know, at home we had a co-stream going on. One of the professional Smash Brothers players, Hungrybox, has been co-streaming the entire uh, last couple hours here. He popped off for one of your kills, and it's viral going on social right now. How does that feel? Um, I'm honored to be a part of Hbox's legacy. <laughs> Woo! You got to love it. Well, we are here at the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup. Who is UTA Arlington gunning for in this event so far? We are beating everyone. All of you. Fisher, MSU, UTD, UT, all of you. 
Woo! Finally, a little bit of trash talk today. You heard it from Davey of UTA, one of the local teams here. When we come back, we'll have some more Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup action. Desk, back to you. Well done, Davey. You know, I hate being right. I hate being right. Once again, sometimes strategy does not matter, and our boy Davey had uh, summed it up so nicely. No plan, just go in, bop, 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 win the game. It's simple enough, Miles. You look like that uh, That frustrates you. It's like the Goku strategy. And, like, we talked about this before, but, like, just the power difference. Again, I talked about how UT Arlington has so many strengths, but that was a showcase of exactly what we meant. We saw moments of brilliance, but, oh, my gosh, UT Arlington overall just dominated that game. Absolutely, and you know we didn't even get to see most of the players on that team. We did get a chance to check out all of them from Manchester, but specifically, a lot of these players were dropping in resources just to take out that one player on the sta stage, Davey. Uh, Miles, tell me about what was really being expended in that moment. Well, you were losing your ability to counterpick. You don't have the ability to know who you're gonna be facing. Because in the optimal scenario, when you're trying to coach, you have one person who has a game plan to take down another. Maybe you have a backup, but if you're forced to improvise, if you have one player, like Davey, running through on the Aegis, then all of a sudden, your crew battle plan is shot. You have to be throwing people in, just like UT Arlington was, except you don't have that foundation to fall back upon. And at the end of the day, that meant that we didn't get to see the full preparedness maybe from Manchester because they were fighting people who they were not ready to. <laughs> well, speaking of foundation, the foundation of Manchester was comprised of three very close quarters fighting game characters. What, what is the issue, Chixa, when you're running a team that has that same archetype for three of your competitors? Yeah, in general, fighting game characters, they have strong combos. They really have larger move sets that can be really unpredictable. But at the end of the day, it's sometimes hard to find an opening, but with the knowledge that we've said that UTA has on the field, they're just really, really phenomenal at understanding the game in general. All of them knew what to do. They knew what they were up against. It wasn't any surprises. They said they just played because they just, they're just that good. They just had that big of brains. Um, I, I will say, even though you know they're strong on the ground, they, they were that strong and easily beat, there was one exception throughout that entirety. And, and that really was Fleetwood being the exception on the side of Manchester. Yeah, you were a big fan of Fleetwood, Artie. I, I know, you were talking up the Min Min. Tell us how you feel. Well, OK, so you've got a, a group of players on your squad who are all doing the fighting game characters, which is totally fine. It's just that that decreases the amount of counterplay you have. A, it gives a lot of intel over to the other team of like, oh, we really don't have to worry about counter swapping too often because they're going to be pulling out, you know, the FGC characters. And then, you know, our our poor poor player Fleetwood gets told Steve is gone bye bye for now. Hence the player tag above their head of save Steve, and forced to play over onto Min Min. Not only does this mean that there was, you know, adaptability, innovation, you know, overcome the tried and true trope of a lot of esports gamers, but we saw Fleetwood get rid of Davey, and then also we're up here on desk thinking, okay, Diddy Kong, beastly on Diddy Kong, going against Min Min, this is going to be hard. You're maybe looking to get one stock off. No, Fleetwood took two stocks off of Diddy Kong in that first game, and all of us on desk were really shocked about it. So I have to give a shout out to Min Min for that one. And Fleetwood, you did a phenomenal job. I'm sorry that Steve was not here to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's still a lot of opportunities. Maybe, you know, you could play it. If, if you want to come to my apartment, you could play Steve there. Otherwise, going to be banned. Uh, but going forward, UT Arlington, they're still in the running. But they are going to go with that idea that every game could be their last. So that's the struggles with double elimination. The saving grace, they're still in it. But the next one, the following, every single match going forward, you're running against, I guess, death, essentially. Your tournament life is at stake. So Miles, could you just tell us what the strengths of every player on that team is? So maybe they could beat Fisher, maybe they'll beat all their opponents? I mean, you heard that bravado. They were obviously trying to have that happen. I, I believe them. 
I believe that they believe they can, but they need to go out there and prove it. And they have the tools to do it. We talked about how UT Arlington really doesn't have any weaknesses. And that's not because the individual players have no weaknesses, but they all cover each other in so many different ways. Like we saw Davey, the very strong opener, just the battering ram br bruising through that first crew battle. We saw Beastly. Amazing. I mean, come on, adaptable. Because even though we saw Fleetwood come out and take down Davey, then Davey comes back in the second crew battle, and well, I don't check what happened in that last match. Um, and then obviously, we saw a tiny little taste of Curry, who has big, bold, impactful play that just booms your mental game. Army Ollie with patient space control, but not afraid to leave that territory that they're establishing and take advantage. And then, of course, there is Phenom, who we did not get to see yet, who is flashy, dynamic, Fox player, who I cannot wait for everyone to see suffocate their opponents. And then, rounding out the whole roster, there's also Smoke, who is maneuverable, a combo-based fiend, but also doesn't need to do that, can also just zone people out. That's a lot of strengths on one team, and all of these players are up around that pretty high skill level. Like, there's no clear weakness. Even if one player finds a matchup they're not comfortable with, there is, I don't think, a single scenario in which they're going to sit there scratching their heads, being like, I have no idea what to do. As you just saw, they know they have one plan. Attack. <laughs> you know, speaking of I don't know what to do, we had a few shots of the players on the stage looking at their phone and they actually keep some information in their phones. It, it looks like they're just bored. That's not the case. That's not the case at all. In fact, it's just notes already. Could you tell me about what could possibly be written there? Just strategies? Well, it, it comes down to, um, as Miles and I were discussing earlier, each character has their own unique set of abilities, especially um, are you more of a, I have to drag this out, I have to get them in the high percentage, percentile of damage before I can actually go for killing blows, or am I you know, the Mario who can just wombo combo someone and then decide I'm going to KO you right now type of character? And just because there's such a deep set of uh, different heroes and characters to choose from, you have to really go back through, refresh your brain, and then also, before you pick your character, you want to look at, okay, what is this person playing? What can I counterattack with? Especially if you're coming in and your goal is to just take all the stocks if you're really trying to make the hero play or if you're like coming in and be like, all right, I'm gonna be the utility here for my team. I'm not the best at playing this counter. So I'm just gonna try and take a stock off, maybe two. And if I get lucky, who knows? Maybe I actually do completely wipe all three. But with that being said, you wanna give yourself a quick refresher. There's a lot of information in every video game you have to keep track of. I mean, like we ourselves have notes on desk that we're constantly updating up here. And players, they keep their own unique notes that they know they need to constantly be refreshing and just reminding themselves of what they need to do. They have to have their win conditions set in their brain before they start a game. Yeah, speaking of having that adaptation throughout the actual match, we had one MVP already set out after the first set. That was going to be Davey, but after just the absolute beatdown that was delivered courtesy of the Diddy Kong, we had to move our MVP for this series to Beastly. Absolutely dominant performance, and even though we had a good run for their money with Fleetwood on the Min Min. Just the decimation of Manchester, it's, it can't be minimized, truly. Was that an attempt at a pun? Uh, you know, I thought of it like right after I said that. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, it can't be min minimized. Yeah, that would have so been better. I, I, I fumbled the bag for real. <laughs> You're just that naturally good. However, Speaking of Min Min, that is what really set Beastly as our MVP, not just because they had a good performance in Crew Battle 1, because if it was just based on Crew Battle 1, it's Davey. Come on, Davey swept six stocks, it was amazing. But as soon as Fleetwood came in, it was eventually, uh, well, very difficult. It was uh, Beastly who had to put them down. They, it took two stocks and they did it. But then the fact that Beastly came in, the second Crew Battle came back even stronger and beat the person who they were sent in to counter in the first place. They did their job, and they did way outside their job description, and that's why for this match against Manchester, Beastly is the MVP. Well said. You know, I still believe that with the confidence that Davey had, maybe this is going to be the team that makes it into the grand finals. I think just the, uh, the basicness of it all, the no thought in head, go win game, 
that's how you actually got a game, folks, at home. I'm, I'm just saying, sometimes strategy isn't the way to go in game and potentially in life. Artie? This is why you're ranch dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's going to wrap it up for the group decider. We're going to come back with a bit more. It's Rocket League on the docket. We'll be back soon with the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup brought to you by McDonald's of North Texas.